In this video, I'm going to talk about parametric EQs and how to approach using them because the approach is different than the one that most people are accustomed to using with a graphic EQ. Graphic EQs are all over the place. A lot of people are comfortable with them. They kind of make sense when you look at them. You've got a slider for a group of bands next to a slider for another group of bands and they span across and you've got the entire frequency range. In this case, on the screen here, you see a 10 band graphic EQ. It has centers at 31, 63, 125, 250, one octave apart. So this is referred to as a one octave equalizer in the sense that the bands are each an octave apart from each other. Another type that's very common, especially with DSPs, is a third octave EQ in which you have three times as many bands. You have 30 or sometimes 31 bands. Um, and those are spaced one third octave apart. So you would have, instead of one band, you would have a total of three bands. You'd have one on either side of that one, and then two on either, or one on either side of that one, etc. And you'd have 30 or 31 bands to play with and more finite control. But what's common to all graphic EQs is that they operate on a fixed frequency, fixed Q basis, okay? in the sense that they are assigned to a particular center frequency. This one's 125 hertz. And they provide you the ability to boost or cut a range of frequencies around 125 hertz. They don't just zero in on 125. They actually affect a little bit of range around them. When they interact with one another, uh, there is a little bit of overlap in most cases, and they can have effects on one another as a result of that. I'm going to take this graphic EQ that I just adjusted slightly and I'm going to flip it into parametric mode so we can look at the response and you can actually see the resulting frequency response that has been created simply by adjusting those bands. All right. Now there are some areas that people don't understand. For example, if we make an adjustment here we would expect that response to follow this blue line, but the actual frequency response of the combination of all these bands is the orange, because all of these bands are slightly interacting with one another, overlapping one another, and we get something slightly different from what we would expect based on just the position of the controls. So even with a graphic, it's important to have a real display of the spectrum that you're affecting when you're manipulating them. All right, so let's put these back to zero, and let's talk about a parametric EQ in comparison. I'm going to expand to one per screen here so we have a larger view and we can look at it a little more carefully. What we have starting here is the graphic EQ. Everything is set up in one octave increments, 125, 250, 500, 1000, it doubles every time, that's what an octave is. And we're able to boost or cut those frequencies just like a graphic EQ. So starting out, the parametric has some things that are very familiar to us. When it's set up this way, you can make it look just like a graphic, and you can actually work it just like a graphic if you never touch that scary Q control that a lot of people are afraid of, or if you never move the frequencies around. But you do have the ability to move frequencies around. That's one of the things that makes it cool. So if you have a problem that, let's say, isn't at 125 hertz, but it's rather at around 160 or 170 hertz, you can move that center frequency over and affect a slightly different frequency than the one you had the graphic band centered on. So that's one of the nice things about a parametric. The cool one I'm working with here in our Tune 3.0 software is what's available in the new VXI amplifiers from JL Audio. As you can see, I can move that center frequency and boost or cut anywhere I want and listen to it in real time, as a matter of fact, which is kind of fun. And then I can go back to where we started. The other control on a parametric EQ is the one that usually results in the most confusion. And that's this thing called Q. And that's this column here in this table. By default, this EQ sets the Q at 1.41, which gives you a good span when you're using spacings of an octave here. But you can easily change that number by right-clicking and pulling you can change the Q to a very low number, this is 0 0.25, or to a very high number, 10 is the maximum for this equalizer. Think of Q as the sharpness of the filter. That's the easiest way to remember it. A high number is more sharp. So here's a Q of 10, really sharp. Here's a Q of 0 0.25, really broad, 
really wide. So that's how you remember it easily. Sharpness is essentially what's being expressed by the Q value. So by being able to adjust this, we can make a single band cover a huge wide range, in this case all the way from like 25 hertz up to 2,500 hertz or so. Okay, with one single band, I'm affecting a response in that wider range. It's pretty amazing. Or I can turn the cue really narrow, really sharp, and I can affect only a very small frequency range, maybe to address a real sharp peak in response that's in the vehicle. So I can make my adjustments very well. Now what throws most people for a loop since they're accustomed to working with graphic EQs is the first thing they try to do is, okay, let me try and use it like a graphic and let me use each band and let me boost and cut until I get what I'm looking for. Boy, I really wish I had more bands because I'm not getting the response I want. That's usually what happens when people use one for the first time and they think that it will work the same way as a graphic EQ. They're, they're all set at 1.41 now. So this is kind of a vain attempt to force it to work. Now let's reset that. Another thing people do is, since this is a full frequency spectrum here from 20 to 20,000 hertz, let's say we're just adjusting a mid-range, right? So another thing people try to do is, hey, since I know I'm just adjusting a mid-range, let me take these extra bands that I'm not going to use because they're outside that range, and let me stick them right in the mid-range where I need them. And then what I'll do is I'll adjust all these bands now that I have a ton of them, and I can make the adjustments that I want and maybe I can get adventurous and mess with the cue a little bit and do something weird there and then I can do that and I can adjust each one just like I use my graphic e my graphic equalizer but also messing with Q now and then to make things really interesting well this is still the wrong approach because you're throwing way too many bands at a problem in this situation so let me offer you a different way of thinking when you're working with a graphic or with a para parametric EQ and you're accustomed to working with a graphic. This is going to change the way you think about it. First thing I'm doing here, I'm taking all these bands and I'm going to scrunch them all the way over here just kind of to make a point. Okay, I'm sticking them over here. What I really want to do is I want to EQ a mid-range speaker. And the mid-range operates from let's say 250 hertz up to about four kilohertz. So it covers this span right here. And let's say I hook up my trusty RTA and I've got a big peak in response at one kilohertz. And it's kind of broad. So I'm gonna grab one band, one band, at one kilohertz. And I'm gonna find this peak. And then I'm gonna adjust the cue until the shape of my cut does the best job of addressing that broad peak in response. Now there could be a couple of wiggles in there, ignore them. We're just looking at the major problem right now. You find the biggest issue and you take one band and you work it left to right in terms of frequency and narrow or wide with the cue control until it's doing, doing a good job of taming that peak in response. Great. Let's say that did a pretty good job of dealing with that major peak, but there's still something going on over here. There's still a little wiggle at around 640 hertz. So now I can grab a second band. Okay, and this band will interact. The blue response that you see here is the response of the filter I'm using, this number 9 EQ here, whereas the orange response is the summed total of all the filters in use. So that's really the overall response you're getting. So now I can adjust the Q on this band, and I can maybe make a narrow cut that overlaps slightly with the other one, and maybe make a slight adjustment. So now I've created a more complex response shape using only two bands of equalization. Now let's say this is a little bit too soft of a knee here for what I need to blend properly with my, with my uh, tweeters. So I'm going to grab another band here and I might just boost slightly in this region to create a flatter response up here. See what I did? I just took this little guy at 2500 hertz, gave it a 0.9 dB boost with the Q right at 1.41 and I can adjust the Q and I can make changes in the way that looks. So, with three bands of EQ, I've created a complex response shape 
that is able to address the specific shape of the problems that I'm dealing with very well without resorting to using lots of filters. To do what I just did here with a graphic EQ would require that you deploy about one-third of the graphic equalizer to accomplish it. And here we're only using, funny enough, one-third of the parametric EQ. So in terms of power, the 10-band parametric really is very similar to a 30-band graphic, except it's easier because you're working from big problem down to small problem every time, and it's much faster and more efficient. And very often you can get away with using only a few filters, okay, which is always better from an audio perspective because there are fewer interactions between filters that can cause unexpected effects. So you can do tons of crazy things, including some shapes that would be impossible to duplicate with a graphic EQ. Um, a parametric allows you to achieve response shapes that would be very challenging for anybody with a third octave graphic to accomplish and to do it with fewer bands in less time. That's really the beauty of parametric equalization. You don't need to use all the bands. As you can see here, I've got four bands. I got six left over for this particular mid. So even if I were EQing a component system, let's say that goes from 80 hertz all the way up to 20 kilohertz, I have enough bands to take care of a resonance down there, to maybe sweeten the tweeter up a little bit. I can take that number 10 band and turn it into a shelving filter with the tune software here in the VXI and give it a nice shelf effect. I can take this other band down here and make sure my crossover region is working exactly the way I want it. Give it a little goose there to make sure it meets up. Okay, there is no lack of power with a parametric equalizer. It is as powerful, if not more powerful, and actually, in my opinion, easier to use once you get the hang of it. The analogy is once you learn how to ride a bicycle, which is the parametric EQ here, you really don't go, you don't want to go back to the tricycle. It's too limiting to not be able to adjust a band's Q and a band's center frequency when equalizing. It's much better to attack problems from big problems down to little problems than to try and throw a tool that's good at little problems at, and lots of them at fixing a big problem. That's why a parametric is, is such a useful tool, and uh, once you get going with it, it will make your life a whole lot easier. I hope that helped. Um, we'll do some more videos over time here on these topics uh, to shed some further light on the BXI and the Tune software, but uh, this particular topic is definitely one that a lot of people were curious about. So there you have it. Thanks a lot.